In the fullness of time, God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might have life through him. The fullness of time is when God chose to become a man, when the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God sent his own begotten Son, his only begotten Son, to become one of us in order to bring us to eternal life. But what do we mean when we say it was in the fullness of time? Why was it in that precise moment that God entered our world? The Jewish people had been chosen by God, set aside from all the other nations to know the true God. But for hundreds of years, they vacillated back and forth between following God and going into paganism, to idolatry. But after they came back from the Babylonian exile, the Jews as a whole stayed faithful to God. I say as a whole because there were some who fell away in the time of the kingdom of the Greeks when Judas Maccabeus and his family rose up to restore the faith in Israel. But as a whole, for about 500 years after the exile, the Jewish people had been locked in to being faithful to Almighty God. That was the first element, that they were really rooted in living the Mosaic law, living the covenant that God had made with Abraham and the covenant God had made with Moses. And they were looking forward to the Messiah. The second element of the fullness of time is that the Greek culture and language had spread throughout the Mediterranean world. And so there was a common language and a common culture and there were uh, people all over the Mediterranean world who were able to hear the Word of God because the Word of God, the Old Testament, had been translated into Greek. And so even the Gentiles were able to hear the Word of God proclaimed and spoken. And then there was the Pax Romani, the peace of Rome. Rome had taken over the entire Mediterranean world, Egypt, all of North Africa, what is now Spain, southern France, Italy, Greece, Turkey, what is now Turkey, Asia Minor, Syria, Lebanon, the Holy Land. And there was even somewhat of peace with the Persian Empire to the east, what is now present-day Iran and, of course, Iraq in between. And so there was a peace, and there were roads, and there was good communication. And it was a ripe time where the word of God could spread. And the Jewish people had actually spread throughout the Mediterranean world. There were more Jews living outside of the Holy Land than in the Holy Land at the time of our Lord's birth. And many of the Greeks, many of the Gentiles not a majority by any means, but probably a significant enough minority, had come to realize, following their great philosophers like Socrates and Aristotle, that their ancient gods were not gods at all, that there could only be one true God. And, so, and they recognized that that one true God must be the God of the Jews. And so there were Greeks who listened to the word of God, who would go to the synagogues to pray, who would try to follow the moral law. And it was all a preparation for the spread of the gospel. In that moment, in that fullness of time, God chose to become a man like us. Not just to appear like a man, but God the Son, the eternal word of God, sprang down from heaven and entered our world in the most tangible and real way imaginable. He became a little baby. He took his human nature from Mary, the humble virgin. She was one of the Anawim, the humble of the land, who was always looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. 
And she had done something very unusual. She had vowed virginity, thereby giving up hope that she would be the mother of the Messiah. It was to that humble virgin who had given up human hope of being the Messiah's mother that the angel Gabriel came to her and announced that God wanted her to be not just the mother of the Messiah, but the mother of God. Because the Messiah would, in fact, be God himself come into our world. She is his mother in every facet of what motherhood is. He was conceived in her womb. He took his entire human nature from her. He grew within her womb. She gave birth to him in a miraculous birth to preserve her virginity. And she nursed him and she raised him. She literally did everything that a mother did for her son. And there could not have been a deeper love and union between mother and son in the history of the world than between Mary and her divine son, Jesus. But oftentimes when we reflect on the Christmas story and this mystery of the incarnation, we forget about the other person in the Holy Family. Or we give him a kind of short shrift. We look and say, oh, St. Joseph, the foster father of Jesus. In our American and English milieu, foster father doesn't in any way add up to what St. Joseph was. For us, foster parents take in a child for a while and then the child may be moved on by the state to another foster family. There's no permanent lifelong bond and relationship formed between foster parents and foster children. No, St. Joseph was a righteous man who decided when the angel appeared to him in the vision in, in a dream and told him to take Mary, his betrothed, into his home he decided to be obedient, completely obedient, because that's what a righteous man was. One who was completely obedient, joyfully obedient to whatever God wanted. And so he took Mary into his home. And if there were any people who looked askance at Mary being pregnant before she had moved into the home of Joseph, St. Joseph was taking the potential dishonor, the sh potential shame upon himself even though he knew that neither Mary nor he had done anything wrong, that this child was, in fact, the Son of God. St. Joseph was our Lord's father in every meaning of what that word is, except the biological father. He took care of Jesus. He raised him. He provided for him. He protected him. He was there for our Lord emotionally, Social, socializing our Lord, teaching him the faith, teaching him virtue, teaching him the law and the prophets, teaching him how to pray. He was a father in every sense of that word. And to this couple, to Mary and Joseph, God the Father came and sent, and sent his son to come into the world, to be here, to live among us, to dwell among us so that we would see his glory and so that he could die for our sins. All of us are born to live and we will die because of original sin and our personal sins. But Jesus Christ came into this world precisely to die to die for our sins and to rise again from the dead, to conquer sin and death and to bring us his own divine life, that we may be shares in the divine nature. So my brothers and sisters, as we reflect on the crash, on the nativity scene, we recognize that this is the ultimate expression of God's love and humility the only possible rival is the crucifixion itself. To see God coming as a little baby, being born not in a castle or in a palace, but in a cave on the outlying, outliers of the little village of Bethlehem, being born to a virgin of the backwater village of Nazareth. And God came in that humility, in that obedience, 
to bring us eternal life. This is the beginning of our salvation. As we meditate, as we continue this Mass, we recognize that the same Lord Jesus who came as a little baby on Christmas Day is the same Jesus that we're going to receive in Holy Communion. And he wants to transform our hearts. The world changed at the birth of Christ. When God came into the world, our lives have to be changed. They could never be the same as they were before because God became man. God became man and has rescued us, has saved us, and given us his own life. May we go forth from this Mass changed forever, that we live always in the light of this great mystery of God's humble love in his incarnation and birth for our salvation. God love you. Have a Merry Christmas.